life is for the living. Death is for the dead. Let life be like music and death a note unsaid. Good afternoon, and with this quote from Langston Hughes, I welcome you to this sad and joyous and auspicious occasion in memory of Professor Victor Isakoff. I am Rodney Miller, and it is my privilege to be the Dean of the College of Fine Arts. And for over 17 years, it was my privilege to call Victor my friend. When this memorial service has concluded, there will be a reception in the Beggs Ballroom on the third floor of the Radigan Student Center. Victor's wife, Julie, and his math colleagues invite you, any and all of you who wish, to come, to commune with one another, to share food and drink with one another, and to share memories with one another. One quick note, however, the only door, because it is Sunday, the only door that is open to the Radigan is the south door um, of the building. So my advice to you would be to drive over and park in the south parking lot rather than walking over in this heat. At this time, I would invite Dr. Ziki Sun, Chair of the Department of Mathematics, Statistics, and Physics, to the lecture. Greetings. Welcome. Thank you all for coming today. So we are here today to pay tribute to Professor Viktor Isakov. She's not only a great mathematician, but also a musician. So first, I would like to give sincere thanks to the uh, School of Music for this special arrangement. It's a feel that with music, this is the perfect way we say goodbye to Victor. Today we say goodbye to Victor. The Wichita State and the, the research community will long remember him as one of the greatest mathematicians who has made a huge contribution to the inverse problem research. Victor obtained his PhD in mathematics in Soviet Union in 1973. He immigrated to the United States in 1987. After briefly visiting the Crown Institute at New York University, then Cornell University, and then the University of Minnesota, Victor finally joined Wichita State as a full professor in 1988. At that time, Victor has already become a well-known mathematician specializing in inverse problem. So with Victor's arrival, Wichita State suddenly became an important name within the research community. And actually, since then, Wichita State has become one of the leading research center for inverse problem in the world. In 1990, I was looking for an academic position, and this was two years after Victor's arrival at Wichita State. So naturally, Wichita State became the first place I sent my application. In my first interview was at Wichita State, and um, my first offer came from Wichita State, and I accept this offer. I accept this offer because of Victor. It's I strongly believe that Wichita State will become an important research center in inverse problem. And also I feel that working with Victor and having him as my mentor will be extremely important in my research career. In 2006, Victor became Wichita State's distinguished professor because of his outstanding contribution to English problems. Victor has been recognized as a world-class authority on English problem because of his many contributions to English problem study, including English potential problem, English source problems, 
inverse conductivity problem, inverse problem in option pricing, and inverse problem for general hyperbolic and parabolic equations. I would like to mention two of Victor's truly outstanding and groundbreaking results in early 90s. One was about the unique recovery of discontinuous conductivity. And Victor was the first one to discover how to deal with the discontinuous conductivity. The second one was about the inverse problem for semi-linear equations. And again, Victor was the first one to discover the linear linearization technique. Victor's work on these two problems has inspired a sequence of related work by many, many people around the world, including me. Here, I have only mentioned a very small portion of Victor's contribution. Throughout his entire research career, Victor published 140 inferential papers on both theoretical and apply problems. And in each paper, Victor demonstrated a powerful technical skill as well as true originality. His research is actually supported by National Science Foundation since 1990. He also wrote three books about English problem in partial differential equations and solvative spaces in mathematics. So to both Wichita State and the research community, Victor's inference and contribution are indelible. He put Wichita State on the map in terms of inverse problem research and built a very strong research group that has tackled a wide range of theoretical and applied problems. Today, we have to say goodbye to Victor, but his legacy will certainly live on through his student, through his colleague at Wichita State and of course, was through many, many people in the research community will remember him forever. Thank you. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Andrew Hippiste, the Dean of Fairman College of Liberal Arts and Science. I am Andrew Hipsey. I'm the Dean of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and I am here to honor the memory of Dr. Victor Isakoff, mathematician. On the behalf of the college, I would also like to thank President Muma and uh, Provost Lefebvre for being here and showing the support of the university and the academy for Victor and all that he represents. The College of Liberal Arts and Sciences is strengthened by having a math and, st and stats department in it, which Victor was a member for so many years. The department has a very special culture. They are like a family with one another. They look after each other and they look out for each other. And that's because they have enormous respect for one another. They have an extremely strong research ethic and track record to go along with it. They are fierce advocates for their discipline. It's significant practical benefits for students of all degrees, not just the sciences and engineering, but also for the beauty of mathematics itself. And I want to pause a moment on the beauty, the aesthetic, if you will, of this wonderful discipline. Because I think Victor embodies that straddling between the practical and the beautiful. It is not a coincidence that we are here in what I think is the most beautiful place on campus, not a hall with a musical instrument, but a beautiful musical instrument with a hall. The music that we will be hearing shortly, Rachmaninoff, perhaps, as expected, I'm particularly looking forward to the Dvorak piano trio. And of course, the wonderful story of how 
Victor and Julie got to know one another over piano lessons, all the ingredients for a delightful Chekhov short story. Victor joined a department that was already quite well known, and then he helped it along to an international reputation and fame, as Zeke just said. He was the recipient of the Emmy Lou Keith and Betty Dutcher Endowed Distinguished Professorship, significant because because it is the only university-wide professorship that we actually have. Many of the faculty in the math and stats department, previous and current, became, came because of Victor's reputation, including Ziki over there. Victor globalized the collocation, inverse problems, and Wichita State University. I was talking recently to a former high up at Cessna, and he said that inverse problems and Wichita State's mathematics departments, and I quote, changed the way we do things at Cessna. On behalf of the Fairmount College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, I honor the memory of Victor Isaacoff, a first class mathematician and esthete, and a lifelong proof of why we really, really need first class mathematicians. I would like to now invite uh, Dr. Boomer Friedman to the stage. Good afternoon. I'm not a professional speaker, but uh, we just lost a wonderful mathematician, a person of very high culture, and a human being, great human being. I lost a trusted friend. Many people will talk today about Victor's accomplishments, his contributions to our department, and in general to WSU's prestige in the academic world. Because of the short time allotted for this speech, I will only mention one thing regarding the value of his work, something that everybody can understand. Uh, this happened last year. 2020 in Washington, D.C., the United States Senate Committee on Appropriations listened to the request by the National Science Foundation seeking to increase government funding for the math portion of the NSF, and the president of the government relations of the American Mathematical Society, who was asked to testify, stated, I quote, at which the State University Professor Victor Isakov is making groundbreaking changes in the way we make measurements in biomedicine, economics, geophysics, and material science. In particular, the results of his work will dramatically enhance the quality of a cheap, fast, and safe diagnostic imaging method called electrical impedance tomography. As mentioned earlier, this is all I'm going to say about Victor's accomplishments in math. I'm sure a number of other people will do a very good job of that. I have known Victor for a third of the century, 33 years. Victor was obviously passionate about mathematics. I would like to talk about the other remarkable side of Victor. Uh, Here's another patience. It's actually give me an eerie feeling. Uh, it started all in this place, and unfortunately it ends in this place. I'll explain in a minute. Uh, recently, after reading the memorial page on the departmental website, one person, one faculty member, asked me how we hired and retained a mathematician of his caliber. 
There is a short answer to that and a slightly longer one. The short answer is just two words. This piano. Not just a piano. This piano. A longer story is different. A long, it's longer. So here it is. At the end of 1980s, I was department chair, we just got the PhD program, and we had a vacant position, and Victor applied. After looking at his credentials, I knew we had to hire. There is no way, we just have to hire. Uh, I looked at this as I would at a mathematical problem and tried to find a solution. How do you do that? In our department, we have a secret weapon for using in such cases. That weapon is also used in cases of student complaints. Uh, it is an open secret now as it has been used for, with us for over half a century. It's called the Brady's treatment. Professor Stephen Brady's charm disarms everybody who talks to him. His persuasive skills are an order of magnitude better than mine and most everybody I know. There is one problem with that though. It works like the current COVID vaccine. It works only in 90 to 92% of cases. At that time, I was ambitious. I needed 100%. He had to be higher. As the military people say, I had to go nuclear. I had to solve a very challenging problem. Uh, remember, after leaving the Soviet Union, he visited powerhouses of mathematics. I mean, he didn't, didn't come here right away. I mean, he stopped on the way in certain, actually, powerhouses of mathematics. Courant uh, Institute, Cornell Institute of Mathematics and Applications at the University of Minnesota, a few months in each. Uh, we just here got our PhD degree and only started building up the research in the department. Though we didn't complete, compete with those places, of course, we were not super attractive at that time in terms of the mathematical environment. I had to add something outside of that to make it 100%. We are talking about 5 to 8%, but it's a problem. I thought I had all figured out. Uh, here's why. I didn't think it would be hard. After all, outside of mathematics, I mean, outside, we, we could talk some mathematics, of course, but outside of mathematics, Uh, we have many identical life experiences. We are from the same generation. The difference in our age is one year. We have been brought up in the same culture, have the same mother tongue. He tried to escape the Soviet Union, was refused first, lost his job in the Russian Academia, until finally was able to leave Russia several years later. That's my story. I was sure I would figure out how to attract him. I mean, he's pretty close. Talk to Lyudmila, my wife, and was ready to tell him everything the Russian newcomer of my generation would be interested in. 
well, and in some other cases, unfortunately not very rare, I overestimated my abilities. When we first met, I told him and showed him everything he might be interested in. He asked me questions that I expected, and I, of course, answered yes to all of them. I was ready. I mean, I figured it out. Uh, however, something was missing. I didn't feel I solved the problem. In most mathematical problems, mathematicians know that. You solve the problem, you almost got it. There is just one little thing. They can take you another 10 years, or they can take you the next morning to figure it out. And that is, that's called luck. So, uh, since I felt he is not, I, I couldn't, I didn't feel it worked. So what do I do? It worked here like in mathematicians solve problems. Pure luck. During the first encounter, he asked something about music. I, of course, answered that we have a whole college where faculty has almost as much fun as mathematicians, all they do day after day is play, sing, and dance. The College of Fine Arts. I'm, I'm sorry, in Russian it sounds less stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he can have as much music as he wants. Uh, we got a ton of music. Uh, and if he wants, I'll take him to this college. He said yes. After he went to his hotel, I had only a few hours to become a guide to the facilities of your college, uh, which I knew only mostly by name. Of course, I visited the performances, concerts, but not the college itself. To make the long story short, I'm not a good salesman, but I had to sell him this college. Uh, just for younger people that are listening here over the internet or over here, this was the time with no internet, period. So just making sure you understand. Uh, the next day I took him to some of the places and eventually we came here. Uh, I was uh, talking about almost new the Marcuson organ. Uh, that's an impressive thing. It did impress him, but again, I didn't feel it was enough. And then the luck striked. What happened is uh, we were standing right over there just looking at it. This piano was in that place. He looked at the piano and went to it. Well, in my wildest dreams, I wouldn't think about showing him a piano. I mean, every third person I know either has a piano or plays the piano or, I mean, why would I show him a piano? No, he went to this piano and he looked at the brand and his face shined. I knew it was a turning point. Uh, he clearly approved it. Uh, the rest is history, of course. Uh, of course, soon after he came here, everybody got to know his passion for music. Now I'm going to do one thing. Uh, I am not, I'm going to thank someone, someone most of you know. Unfortunately, I cannot thank that person uh, in person. He passed away over 25 years ago. I'm talking about the 
Victor's God in music. Sviatoslav Richter. Uh, this is what I found out later. Who knew? Uh, I also found out very soon after he came that it was he had to consider his career. He wanted to be a musician, uh, a piano player, but he couldn't play. He thought he couldn't play as well as Richter, so he decided to go in mathematics. So because I can't talk to Richter, uh, Sviatoslav Richter, directly, I'll just want to say, and I cannot talk for the inverse uh, problems community, I'm not in inverse problems, but in case they forget, those who I know might not even know that, I'd like to thank uh, this legendary Richter for Victor's being in mathematics. Uh, in terms of solving the retention problem, because that was another question. Well, of course, we did some trivial things. With his and other faculty help, we built a solid research department. We had a wonderful research atmosphere in the department for the past 30 years. All these are trivial steps, obviously help to keep Victor here. But I believe a very important component that kept Victor happy is again related to a piano. More precisely to a pianist. I will only say this. If we gave out prizes to best friends of the mathematics department, the very first award would go to the remarkably accomplished pianist, professor of piano in our university, who also happens to be Victor's wife, Dr. Julie Bees. Let me finish saying that I'm very, very sorry for the loss of Victor, but I'm also very grateful for having had him here for over 30 years. Thank you. Okay, um, our next speaker is Dr. Tom DeLillo, and he also was our former chair, and he worked with Victor on the uh, computational aspect of English problem. Too long any more. <laughs> well, as, as I thought of this, uh, what I wanted to say, uh, it kept getting longer and longer, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep the schedule, but uh, I make no guarantees here. Uh, well, Victor, was, as it's been said, he was a great and generous uh, colleague. He and I both arrived here in uh, 1988 together. I was very lucky in my early career to have not just one, but three senior mathematicians to mentor me. The uh, first two were John Falsgraf of Chapel Hill and Alan Elkrat, who passed away a few years ago here for work in uh, conformal mapping, numerical work mainly. And later on, uh, Victor for work in inverse problems. I probably needed all three of them. Uh, sadly, they were all gone now. The work uh, Alan, John, and I did um, that we were proudest of uh, was, um, was to extend the well-known 150-year-old mathematics goes back a while, 150-year-old schwartz christoffel transformation. Victor, following the Russian tradition, referred to it as christoffel schwartz In fact, he was correct because uh, the formula was discovered independently by Christoffel in uh, in 1867 and by Schwartz in 1869. So once, as we know, once Victor got settled at uh, WSU, he received steady 
NSF funding for his broad work in uh, inverse problems for partial differential equation. I'm sure others will say a word about this, but an inverse problem briefly is the direct problem is if you know the mathematical equation, you can predict the outcome, the effect. And the inverse problem is if you can measure the effect, can you back out the, the parameters in the equation? It's a much more sensitive problem. Um, so uh, anyway, a good portion of the external funding that I was involved in here was rewarded because Victor uh, was either PI or co-PI on the, on, the, uh, on the grants. I worked with him on two problems. One's been mentioned briefly by Ardeen. Uh, uh, one on diagnosing sources of noise in the interior of uh, business jet ca cabins, which started with the... Uh, with, um, and I worked on the computational aspects with him and his students. Uh, that started from some startup funds from Cessna, and uh, we, it led to more uh, follow-on funding from the uh, NSF. Um, that, and it happened that I, uh, I invited my friend from Cessna to give a talk in the department. He brought his group out, and they talked about three problems, and one of them, this, this uh, noise problem, Victor immediately recognizes an inverse problem. So that one thing led to another, and we got good, good funding there. Um, Victor was not a numerical analyst. I worked on the numerical code, but he did set the, set the equations and the problems up in such a way that it was just about optimal for, uh, for solving the, uh, the problem and actually getting numbers out that made sense. Um, the second, uh, the second, Funding came some years later, and it was on uh, it was on work in, uh, in gravimetry, which is one of his original contributions. Um, this involves uh, the inverse problem. There is, if you can measure the, the the gravitational field, can you re can you find out what caused it? So it's a kind of a detection problem. It was funded by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. None of us had ever heard of this agency before, <laughs> but they had heard of Victor. They knew, knew about his, inverse, his first book on inverse source problems, and they came and paid us a visit. And uh, eventually, we, they funded our, our inverse problems group uh, for a few years. Uh, and I should also say, I'm an applied mathematician, but. Uh, these were, uh, let's see, two of the few cases where I actually got to apply methods to real-world data. Um, in the case of the, the Cessna problem, it was pressure measurements of noise, if you can find, out, find where the cabin's vibrating. In the case of the National, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is under the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So I can't tell you what that data was. Victor had a sly sense of humor. Uh, during my term as department chair, I would see him in the hall, and he would greet me as Big Boss. <laughs> the smile on my face, I, I, I don't think he was in complete awe of my authority. Uh, uh, let's see what else I have to say. This. Um, yeah, I should mention that among the things uh, after that uh, we did, we, he was always ready when we reached out to, we were always, besides our own work, looking for opportunities to reach out to industry and so forth. And he was always there to, we went to visit Airbus shortly when they came to campus and Dassault and so forth and uh, talked to the engineers. Uh, and we were going to do more last year, but it slowed down a bit, and uh, now that things are opening up, I hope we can take this up again. My dean is encouraging this activity. Uh, however, I must say I will be a lot less confident of uh, our abilities to follow up on potential problems with, uh, without Victor on the team. Uh, we will have to do some extra thinking, I think. I should say that modern uh, computers and technology, the thing that's going on now, is very powerful. 
I do a lot of computation myself. A computer can generate nonsense very rapidly. <laughs> and without, without a mathematical analysis, some strong basis in mathematical analysis that a person like Victor can provide, it's, it's uh, easy to uh, imagine some uh, nonsense. I, was, I, I have to say something about the other thing Victor and I are really happy to be here about is the great music department. And, uh, and so we're on the innovation campus and every, the administration is encouraging us to go out and make connections and innovate and so forth. Um, and that's great, innovation is great, but if, if you don't do it carefully enough, it may not be helpful, it may be a disaster. And I think of one of my favorite operatic scenes from uh, Don Carlo's, uh, or Verdi's uh, opera Don Carlo. I'm a fan of the bass voice, and there's a tremendous scene between the King Philip II of Spain and the Grand Inquisitor. It seems that King Philip has befriended the baritone Who's, uh, who's a friend, of, uh, who is a member of the, uh, of the uh, rebels in Flanders, and the Grand Inquisitor does not like this. And so there's a tremendous duet back and forth between the two, which is really worth reading. But uh, at one point, I promised I wouldn't sing in this building, but at one point, the Grand Inquisitor trying to argue with the, uh, with the uh, king, that was when the church really had power, says, L'idée de novator a tesum penetrate. The ideas of the innovators have penetrated your mind. <laughs> so, so it's very careful that we learn how to innovate properly. Uh, and I hope Victor was always ready, but he was, he was there to, uh, to uh, help make the foundations correct. Um, I should say, well, I could go on and on, and I think I will. Yeah. Uh, one, uh, two last comments. Many of you are, are familiar with the, with the kind of bizarre ideas that faculty can come up with on committees. Uh, I recall a discussion many years ago uh, about developing criteria for distinguished professors. One faculty member, no doubt trying to be helpful, suggested that the usual annual post-tenural review of faculty was insufficient for a distinguished professor, and that an additional super-secret review was needed. Uh, no doubt with, uh, you know, with, with more forms and many boxes to fill out, mysterious categories to be checked, and lists of extra goals to be carefully evaluated and weighed by administrators at higher and higher levels of authority before the record of the professor could be ratified as, as uh, sufficiently uh, distinguished. Uh, in, this, in Victor's case, there was sort of been uh, truly bizarre. <laughs> so, I'll just close with a quote, one of which Victor smiled at me about, but there are two quotes by famous mathematicians that I think of lately having lost some close colleagues. Um, one is by Fritz John, who, who was uh, one of Victor's supporters, heroes at Courant um, Institute in NYU. When Victor first arrived there, Fritz John was, was, uh, uh, supported his, his, his visit. And Professor John once said of himself that he wanted neither fame nor fortune, but rather the grudging admiration of a few close friends. <laughs> Um, the other quote is by the English mathematician G. H. Hardy in his famous essay, A Mathematician's Apology. The passage is also used in the movie The Man Who Knew Infinity about uh, uh, Ramanujan's life, the famous Indian self-taught mathematician who Hardy more or less discovered. And at the end of the movie in the essay, Hardy is memorializing Ramanujan after his, who, who died early, and he says the following, all my best work has been bound up with, uh, li with his collaborator, main collaborators, Littlewood and Ramanujan. I still say to myself when I am depressed, 
and find myself forced to listen to pompous and tiresome people, all present company aside, uh, uh, pompous and tiresome people that, um, I lost my place here. Uh, well, I, he says to himself, well, I have done something you could never have done. That is to have collaborated with both Littlewood and Ramanujan on something like equal terms. This is how mathematicians feel about each other, I think, at some level. And it's an impersonal field, but there's a deep connection. In any case, I like to think it's not too much of an exaggeration to say that I have collaborated with Elkrat, Falsgraf, and Azakov, at least in numerics, on something like equal terms. It's been great to have him here, and it's a big loss to our department. Uh, and we were lucky to have, have him here for such a distinguished mathematician for so long a career, and I'll miss him very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Steve Brady. And Steve was the uh, search committee chair 33 years ago who brought Victor into the Wichita State. Since he mentioned that I was the chair, I'll, I'll make a comment about that. Uh, I have been chair or part of committees of hiring people wanting to build a department for over 50 years. And so I want to tell you a little bit about that because some of the reflections I have about Victor are involved with searches. Um, and so I'm a, most of you know about these things, but I thought I would kind of mention when there's a search, when we get permission to hire someone, there's usually a committee of six, eight people sometimes. Um, and there's a deadline that people have to submit. At Wichita State, you submit your application to human resources, a branch of human resources, but all letters of recommendation go to the chair of the committee, who is me. And so depending on how many people apply, we sometimes get, or I sometimes used to get a lot of letters in the mail, and nowadays a lot of letters become email. And I have something to tell you about that in a minute. Uh, the most applicants we ever had for one position was 933. And each applicant is responsible for at least three recommendations coming to them. And so sometimes uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of letters to read when uh, there is a search. In any event, I want to give you a glimpse of Victor Zakoff from a sort of a search perspective. Um, and I'm going to talk about three things real quickly. One is Victor's breadth of knowledge that I learned about very quickly when I first talked to him on a first conversation on the telephone. I'll tell you about that. Also, I have a piano story to talk about. Uh, and then third, uh, and by, by the way, both of those first two stories were 30 years ago, and then last was something that happened last year, uh, which I'll finish with. Uh, as far as this, the breadth of knowledge, when I first well, when the committee decides who we would like to interview, and there's, there are also administrative procedures and red tape and other things to go through, but when we're able to call someone, and we still do that, I still call people on the telephone if I can. We interview sometimes people in Siberia, and that's a little more difficult. But uh, when we can telephone people, we do that. And I talked to Victor and uh, was very happy. I mean, Dr. Friedman talked about the fact that once we knew he had applied with somebody we wanted to hire. And so I didn't want to screw up uh, in a conversation. And the normal thing you do when you talk to somebody, you, want, you invite them to come and, and tell them about airplanes and hotels and all that. And you tell them that they are to give a one-hour talk on their research. So Victor, and this is what I want to tell you about, he said, what topic would you like me to talk about? And no one had ever asked me that before, because everybody usually knows what topic they're going to talk about. In Victor's case, he said, I can talk on, and he listed three or four different areas of mathematics, um, not totally unrelated, but related. And he sent me in mail two abstracts, and he wanted me to choose his talk. And I've never told anybody this. 
but I, am, I actually chose the talk he gave. Uh, and that's the only time that ever happened. Uh, and no one's ever even thought about that. I've never heard that even happening before or after. But uh, if any of you were at that talk and didn't like it, I apologize because I had something to do with the choice. The second thing, and to me, that to he, he, was, he didn't even care at the time which one I would tell him about before he got here. He was prepared to talk about two or three different things. And to me, that's, that's rare among mathematicians. Um, the second thing involves uh, something my wife and I did when we moved to Wichita, and that was in 1967. I came for nine months. I'm still here, uh, I think. In any event, one of the things we bought was a Somer console piano. And we were told at the time, I don't know if any of you know, but there was a Jenkins Music Company downtown, if you're old enough to know about those things, across from Macy's, if you're old enough to know we once had a Macy's store in Wichita. And uh, the, the salesman said that for grand pianos, you want to buy a Steinway. But for consoles, there are brothers in New York named the Somer Brothers, and they make the best console. So we bought this console piano, and I should tell you, my mother and my older brother are both pianists. So they, my mother wanted me to play more piano than I did. In my family, if we had a distant relative come to visit and they saw me first, they would say, are you the one who plays? And I always had to say no, because I knew they met my brother. And so while I could play the piano, I couldn't play the way they meant when they asked that question. In any event, Victor, when he came, we had a party for him. And the party was at my house. And he saw this piano, and he said, oh, you have this piano. Um, can I play it? Now, Dr. Friedman already said, we want to make sure he comes, takes the job. I suddenly got the feeling like, what if it's not in tune? to the extent that he would like it to be. Uh, I would have had it tuned had I known he would have liked to play. But anyway, my mother had sent me a box of music, classical music, because she wanted me to get back into it. And so I had this box of music uh, in cardboard, and he took out various pieces. And during that evening, uh, I don't remember how many pieces he played, but he played the piano. And as I say, I was worried about the tune the whole time. But if it were not in the best of tune, he didn't uh, acknowledge it. Anyway, uh, some of you from music school might tell me whether we were sold a lemon with the Somer piano or whether they're actually good. We've never known, but uh, it's a good enough quality that pleases my wife and I. And except for our family, the only other person who has ever touched the piano was Victor. And so we will always remember, or I will always remember, I don't know if my wife does, but I always remember that she and I play and Victor played, and they're the only people who played the piano in, a, in its existence since 1968, I think. Anyway, the third thing. Last year, we had a search, which was actually later called off, uh, but we had a search for a statistics professor. It was an emergency search because of, a, of, of something that happened in the department. And one of the applicants wrote because every applicant, as I told you earlier, needs to have three reference letters sent to me. One of the applicants wrote a reference and asked if the reference would write a letter for him, but also asked if he should apply to Wichita State University. Now, there's no way I would normally know about this, except not all professors of math and statistics know too much about computers. That might surprise you. but. Sometimes <clears throat> more is sent back to me than the perhaps person sending it wishes to send to me. And so what I got was a correspondence between the professor and the applicant as to whether the applicant should apply. And what the professor said was, it's OK, apply to Wichita, Wichita State, it is a decent place. The math department is a decent place. They have Victor Isakov. Our next speaker is Dr. Peter Kuchman, 
And uh, Dr. Kuchman is uh, also a math faculty in our department from 2000, uh, 1990 to 2001. And he also was a, a world class expert in the in problem. And uh, since 2001, he has been with Texas NM. I have to apologize. I spent 20 years in Texas. I have to apologize for my heavy Texan accent. <laughs> no Texan accent? Okay. Even better. Uh, by the way, uh, Dr. Brady mentioned that attra the attraction of the department here, uh, it was one of the main reasons that I came to this department since Viktor Isakov was here. And at the time, at that time, I was working on different areas. I just wrote a random first paper in inverse problems, and Victor was very important for me to get deeper and deeper in this area. Now we all heard that he was a great mathematician. Sometimes we say this, exaggerating a little bit. It's not the case. Now I am deeply into inverse problems, and I can tell you this is a huge area around the world, encompassing not only mathematicians, but physicists, medical doctors, engineers, geophysicists. There is not a single person who doesn't know work and books by Victor. I even have several copies of each of his books, and when there is new edition, I buy it for myself and my students. So. Uh, I am preaching to the choir, I just want to confirm that he is a really world-class, renowned mathematician. Uh, but there is something else about Victor which distinguishes him from many of us mathematicians, and first of all from me. He, he was a perfect gentleman. To tell you the truth, it's not very often you meet a scientist, mathematician, who is a perfect gentleman. And uh, for me, he is a representative of the dying breed of the world famous Russian intelligentsia. And I say dying breed since the features that belong to this intelligentsia are going away. And for me, the main ones are that, on one hand, mild manners and at the same time, firm principles. On the other hand, uh, the second feature is that such a person is well learned, studied, read, knows music, very frequently plays music, but never enforces his or her opinion on you. This is all second feature. Now, this combination is not very frequent, and I definitely don't have either of them. Uh, but Victor did, and he was a perfect gentleman. I just give you two examples. Uh, sometimes being perfect gentleman, it's difficult. You go against the grain. And uh, his mild manners with firm principles were uh, exhibited, for instance, when in the beginning of the 80s he, did, he got so disappointed by the Soviet system, as many of us, that he decided to leave the Soviet Union. He was immediately fired. He was one of so-called refuseniks. He was immediately fired. He was associate professor of mathematics at a leading university. He didn't have a job. He worked as a librarian for five years till finally he was let go and it didn't destroy him. This didn't destroy him. He still was a great mathematician and was only improving after coming to this country. This is the example that firm principles sometimes are painful to sustain. Now about him not pushing opinions, even about the things that he knew very well. This is my personal uh, um, experience. When we came here, it was the first time I would drive a car. And you can imagine how well I was doing this. Especially passing the driving test in Kansas was so easy. You essentially didn't have to learn how to drive, but you pass it. Uh, 
So, and I had humongous car, some of the faculty members remember this. It was 1976 uh, Ford Station Wagon LTD. That's the biggest car I've ever seen, even in the US. And so, uh, once I was driving, after some time, when it was already safe to drive with me, so I was driving um, Victor somewhere, and it got dark, so I turned on the lights. And Victor said, you know, you have this red light that came on. I said, but sure, I turned on the lights. That's what it shows. Victor said, hmm, <laughs> nothing else. But it got me a little bit worried. After that, I dropped him, and I drove, and I understood that I've noticed that Americans who seem to be very nice and polite people, when they are on the road, they are awful. Every single car driving toward me flashes a light. Every single. And then I, with horror, start thinking that if everyone does this, maybe something is wrong with me. Yes, I was driving with high beams on <laughs> in the city. So, he, he knew what was wrong, but I, was so, I told him so confidently that I know what it is, that he didn't want to disappoint me. So we, I and my family, we owe Victor a lot. I already told you that uh, working with him and Ziki-san and Weima and many other uh, prominent people in the department helped me developed significantly in the area of mathematics, and it was a pleasant experience. But we all, especially Victor, since he was instrumental to large part in bringing us here, then he would chaperone us all the time. We came knowing nothing about the U.S., having negative amount of money, and he helped us with settling down, with apartment, with with furniture. He would drive us to all stores, help us buy things and show what is where. So, not only in mathematics, but in general in our life, he played an important role. Uh, we spent many nice evenings together in our house, in his house. I especially remember when, he, when we had to break a bottle of champagne, champagne for his just acquired um, Steinway Grand Piano. And he played a little bit, I mean, drank, it was really nice. So we owe Victor a lot, and we will definitely, he's forever in our hearts, and his uh, beautiful wife, Julie Biz, has family in Texas. So just don't pay attention to Texas next. And I want to finish uh, with my mediocre translation of two lines from a poem, a poem of a uh, Russian poet, Zhukovsky. So I apologize for my own translation. Don't say with sorrow that they are gone, but with the gratitude they were. Our next speaker is Dr. Area Bushwai. Dr. Bushwai uh, was Victor's formal PhD student in the 90s. And after the graduation, he, was, he has been with Coke Industry for 22 years. And he was the formal president of Coke Global Partner. And also, he is an adjunct professor at New York University, teaching classes in mass financial programs. I just want to share one quick story, one day with Victor. Um, by looking back, I now recognize it probably was um, one of the most important days in my life. It was my, and I apologize if I get emotional, it was um, my uh, Welcome to America Day. So in summer 1993, I was um, coming to study with um, uh, Professor Isakov. Uh, in truth, I had no idea who he was. I never met him before. I never spoken to him. 
I never even read any of his papers. Um, the only reason I came here, I wanted to look to see what America looked like. So I sent a bunch of different letters to various professors across the country, and I only got one back from Victor, so the choice was easy. Uh, communication was a challenge back then. We didn't have email, internet, um, no mobile phones, so it was a handwritten letter. I wish I kept it, I didn't. Uh, so he sent me a handwritten letter, basically come over here. I'm sure he did a due diligence on it. I, I'm fairly sure he did. Uh, so the agreement was somehow we agreed that I need to get myself to Kansas City Greyhound bus terminal where Victor would pick me up. So we agree on time through friends and family. Uh, so I had a really long travel from Siberia. It was a bit bumpy, almost lost my bags, had some really tense encounters during the night ride on Greyhound bus. Um, temperature was, I remember, over 100 degrees, like today. I never experienced that before. Uh, by the time I get to Kansas City, I already spent about 20% of my total savings just staying hydrating. My budget was very tiny. And the worst, when I got to Kansas City, there was no signs of my professor at all. So I sit there for probably a couple of hours trying to figure out is there a difference between Kansas City, Missouri, or Kansas City, Kansas? Am I on the right bus terminal? So I think I finally basically started to really question my decision, why, why did I come here? Uh, what's my backup plan? Do I have enough money to get back to Chicago and somehow fly back to the Soviet Union? So I think I fell asleep. Um, and then finally somebody tapped on my shoulder. And it very, I, I really remember that voice. It was uh, very cheerful, calm, but optimistic. Welcome to America. So Victor apparently had his own share of challenges this day. But later on, I realized he never complains. He never lets anyone to know about his challenges. If anything, he wants to turn a challenge into a lesson. So I got my first lesson probably in the five minutes after we got into the car. Um, he didn't explain me what happened. I realized it was something related to the car. So, but the way how he presented it to me based on my recollection, he kind of said, Ilya, listen, here in America, um, they sell you a lot of stuff. Most of it is garbage. So be careful. There is one company that you should seriously consider to invest. He wasn't sure about my English, so he actually named this company in Russian. He said, it's very easy to remember. It's called A-A-A, like A-A-A. Uh, and I was staring at him, like, he basically said, well, if you ever have a problem on the road, and apparently that morning he did, they come help you out, they give you gas, they tow your car, and then he noticed I was keenly interested in all these maps laying around his car, and he said, and they'll give you free maps too. Um, okay, so the day was getting like, progressively better because I already hit my low point, so it looks like the professor is actually a somewhat cheerful guy. But I was very nervous because, again, I didn't read any of his paper. So, I, I mean, how am I going to bring it up? And we have a three-hour drive. So very careful, I started to, to kind of approach him about mathematics. And then he cut it off right. I think he smelled it. I really, I, I really uh, think he, he did. Uh, he cut it off right away. Okay, Ilya, we're not talking about math here. Just forget about it. We have plenty of time to talk about mathematics. And then my pressure went down like, dramatically right away. So I have at least a week to catch up uh, in, a, in a library. And by the way, the reason I couldn't read his papers in my, our Siberian school, I think they just uh, removed them. As basically when he immigrated, really it wasn't, they were not there. No books, no papers. Instead, he said, 
uh, let's uh, make use of our time. I have friends here in Kansas City. We are immigrants. We need to stick together. So we need to help each other. So let me go and introduce you to my friends in Kansas City because it's very, very difficult to fly in and out of Wichita. So it's much cheaper for you to fly out of Kansas City. So once I introduce you to them, then you're going to stay with them next time. It's going to save you a lot of money. Uh, and his friends became our friends, and I did in, indeed stay with them for the next 10 years every time I flew out of Wichita. There was no Wichita Chicago flight at the time. And besides, he said, you're probably hungry, so you need something to eat. So he introduced me to his friends. So my mood was gradually getting better and better. So we got in the car, still three-hour drive. And I don't remember, I mean, these three hours really flew. Victor was keenly interested in the latest Russian anecdotes. So we spent three hours just telling jokes. And he was very up to date, actually, on American jokes. And we were laughing nonstop for three hours. So by the end of the day, again, I haven't slept for probably 48 hours. Uh, I was getting tired. But my mood turned totally 180 degrees. So I was sort of uh, recapping my first day in America. So I got my first investment advice on AAA. I still have it. Just never dropped the membership. Uh, so I started to build my network in Kansas City, which I have used for many, many years after that. And I've had an experience of joking with a math professor for three hours. That's something I've never experienced before in, in, in Russia or Soviet Union. And the professor seems to be a decent guy. And I guess most importantly, I got a sense of some kind of a stability somewhere nearby that I can always reach out if it becomes necessary. And I was just thinking before going to bed, oh, you know what, maybe that America thing is not so bad after all. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll give it a shot and stay at least a few weeks here, see how things go. So I think I crashed. I mean, I went to bed. And, um, and I do remember the next morning, I probably slept too long. And then Victor finally woke me up. I was in his basement. And, we, and he said, good morning, America. Uh, and that was actually the name of the very popular but prohibited radio show in Russia, which was subject of many of our jokes the night before. And then he made a pause, and he said, the fried eggs are ready. It would be a really nice day. Let's go and find a place for you to live. Thank you, Victor, from me, from my family. So, sorry, I'm getting a bit emotional. I, I guess with your, um, quiet leadership and open-mindedness um, allows me to find my own passion in America, have a, have a career of American dream, and I guess finally have my own family settled here, for, hopefully for many generations. Thanks from my entire family. Our next speaker is Dr. Matir uh, Eller. Uh, Dr. Eller was also a Victor's former PhD student in the 90s, and he's now a math professor at Georgetown University. Yeah, Victor taught me mathematics in a way which has defined my career as a mathematician. I mean, today I want to talk a little bit about more personal things. And as many of you have already said, Victor was a fine pianist. And already when I was a graduate student, we got together regularly to play music together in his house at Farmstead Court. And 
Victor invited me to play sonatas by Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, and even Cesar Frank on my violin, which was always a challenge for me. I'm only an amateur, and Victor was a very good sight reader. He could always play everything right away. And usually for a violinist, if you play together with a pianist, yeah, you, are, you have only the melody. So that's actually easier for the violin, but the roles were reversed. So that was interesting, but we enjoyed this a lot. And starting 2000, I lived in Washington, D.C., and Victor would be visiting his good friend Alexander, who lived in the Virginia suburbs, about once a year. And Victor would usually then also come to Georgetown, and we would talk about mathematics, also with Nicholas Valdivia, who was also his PhD student who also lived in Washington. And then he would invite us, usually for a party, to Alexander's. And these were very nice evenings. And Victor was also a great chef, by the way. One of my favorite dishes was his plof, yeah. a Russian rice dish, a humongous rice dish with origins in Central Asia. And Victor had told us a little bit about the history. And well, when we were at Alexander's house, we roamed freely around. And then my wife and I went to the kitchen. We looked into this big pot of plov, and we discovered there was a whole bulb of garlic in there to flavor it. So I was amazed, and it was really great. Then there was always a lot of good wine. Yes, and that helped me then to play the violin later in the evening. <laughs> I was usually a little bit shy. Alexander had a baby grand piano, and then we would play some of our favorite sonatas. I have now looked back and looked through yeah, my book of Mozart sonatas, so there are at least seven sonatas I got to know only because of Victor. So that is quite a treasure, but I will never forget, forget how Victor played the opening measures of the second movement of Beethoven, Opus 30, number two. After a wild and furious first movement in C minor, which ends on a defiant note, the second movement is a great contrast. Adagio cantabile. And the piano has the eight first measures by itself. And I always loved listening to Victor. And he played these opening measures beautifully, in tempo, with grace and with peace. Our last speaker is Ms. Esso Titi. Esso is Victor's current PhD student. He's expecting graduate this summer. Hello. Dr. Isakov was my advisor. I began to know him through his publications when I was working on my master's degree in 2013 at Berzeit University in Palestine. In fact, my supervisor at that time, Dr. Ala Eddin, was one of Professor Isokov PhD students. He graduated in 1996. I started working with Professor Isokov from spring 2017 when I came to Wichita State University working for my PhD. I studied in his classes. Most of my graduate courses were with him, in addition to dissertation hours. He covered me completely from his last grant for a couple of semesters where there was no need to uh, teach, and I focused more on research. He was very serious about research and publications. He really spent time and effort to work on his papers. When I was writing papers with him 
and I actually I had a personal experience because I had two papers with him. He edited the, the scripts word by word for many times. He often said to me that the readers should learn something new from a well-written paper. I really enjoyed working with him, and I learned a lot from him. Professor Isakov was, has done a great contribution to the field of inverse problems, and I'm sure that his achievements will need to be referred to by many researchers in the future. I really don't have too many st stories to tell about Dr. Isakov, but as one of his graduate students, there is really no word to express my sincere appreciation to him for his valuable and tireless guidance. He helped shape part of my life, and I will remember him forever. Thank you. Okay, next we are going to have a video presentation by people from the inverse problem research community. And um, many of them cannot attend this uh, memorial service in person. So, uh, is sending the video clip. And uh, actually, when I previewed these clips, I was deeply moved by their story and their touching sharings. So I'd like to use this opportunity to say thank you to each one of them for their contribution to the event. I want to express my sincere condolences uh, to Victor's wife and his family on his passing. It's a great loss for them, for his colleagues at Wichita State, and all of the Inverse Problems community worldwide. I became aware of Victor's work in the late 80s when I was sent by a leading journal, one of his papers to referee. I immediately realized that the author, whom I didn't know, was a, an original mathematician, a first-rate mathematician. This, the paper had a very nice and beautiful idea. I had a, uh, the privilege of uh, visiting Victor personally for uh, meeting Victor personally for the first time. In, when I visited him in 1990, he was an extremely gracious host. At that time, he was working on his book uh, called Inverse Problems for Partial Differential Equations, is the technical name that became a classic in the field. In the next 30 years, we met many times at conferences and also in visits to, visits to Wichita State. And we talked many times. We only collaborated one paper, but I appreciated very much his uh, original thinking. He had very nice ideas. He made great contributions to our field. But most important, he was always very generous, um, kind, especially with the young people. He will be sorely missed. Uh, goodbye, my friend, uh, rest in peace. Hello, my name is John Sylvester. Victor and I have been friends for over 30 years. We first met in 1987 when we were both visiting the Quran Institute for a semester. From the beginning, I found Victor to be humble, always easy to talk to and always willing to explain something, even if it took two or even three different explanations before I finally understood. That attitude never changed, even as he became more well known and his accomplishments grew. In the past decades, we met mostly at conferences and would frequently take long walks, sometimes for several hours, discussing whatever came to mind. I always sought Victor's advice about difficult editorial decisions, and he was always happy to help. 
I think of Victor not so much as a colleague, but more of more as a good friend, and I will miss him. Hello, everyone. Uh, I treasure the memories of all my interactions with Victor. He was a real gentleman. He loved mathematics. He had an extensive knowledge of PDEs, and I learned a lot from him. He was excited especially about new ideas um, and contributed many original ones over the course of an impressive career. Um, he was open and a pleasure to talk to. Uh, we also shared a love of music where he had uh, equally high standards. I remember with fondness when Victor and Julie visited us about 20 years ago, and we spent the whole evening listening uh, to recordings of great pianists, uh, in particular Sviatoslav Richter, with whom uh, Victor and I both uh, loved. I then tried to uh, slip in um, a piece uh, with um, a slightly less known pianist whom I was fond of, uh, and I remember Victor looking at me and saying, why did you play that one? Uh, but he was very proud of uh, Julie's playing, and he sent me a CD of a recital of hers, uh, which I still have. Victor, may your memory be a blessing. For those who don't know me, I am Lassi Peiverinta from Tallinn University of Technology. In this memorial tribute of Viktor Mihailovich Isakov, I memorize him as a colleague and friend, but also as inspiration. I met him the first time nearly 30 years ago in the Lapland Conference of, on Inverse Problems. My first impression on him was that he was fearless and friendly. He could not betray anyone. As a thinker, he was more than anything, deep, both in mathematics and in culture. In 1995, I visited Wichita and I stayed in his house. During long evenings, we discussed mathematics, not only about inverse problems, but in general, he played his grand piano and crime and punishment were there at least in discussed literature. For the Russian Finnish friendship, we finished several bottles of vodka. Sikisun's email carrying the news from Victor's passing arrived to me on May 31st. I read it next day in the afternoon at 5 p.m. <clears throat> My thought went to Andalusian poet Federico Garcia Lorca and to his poem Lament for Death of Bullfighter, Rianto por Ignacio Sanchez Mejias. Mejias was a personal friend of Lorca. At five in the afternoon, it was exactly five in the afternoon, a boy brought a white sheet at five in the afternoon a frail of lime ready prevent, uh, preserved at five in the afternoon. A las cinco de la tarde, <coughs> eran las cinco el punto de la tarde, un niño trajo la planca sabana a las cinco a la tarde, una espuerta del cal ya prevenida a las cinco de la tarde. Lo de mías era muerte y solo muerte, a las cinco de la tarde. Farewell, Victor, and rest in peace.
My name is Bill Rundell, and I'm glad to be able to speak at, at this funeral. I've known Victor for well over 30 years, and I always look forward to meeting him at, at conferences. I'd like to tell you one story about such a conference. 25 years ago, Oba Wolfach, and in those days the, the convention was to have a musical evening, typically after the walk on Wednesday. Downstairs in the basement there was violins, violas, cellos, and a Steinway. Victor was of course in his element, and the audience egged him on, wouldn't let him stop, and one seasoned observer of these things, himself an accomplished musician, said this is by far the best musical evening he'd ever seen at Ola Wolfach. There was other reasons too why I wanted to meet Victor at meetings. I would store up questions for him that were puzzle for me. And often Victor would say, hmm, that's, that's going to be hard. Well, that was good because that meant that problem could be chalked off my to-do list. Victor was a wonderful human being. Everyone liked him. And everyone liked him for a very, very good reason. He was kind. He liked people. And he loved mathematics. He was actually utterly sensible. Well, except for one thing. He had this penchant during talks for making his slides out of a bad photocopy of his latest paper. But the content was always there. And people, of course, forgave him. Uh, it's hard to say much more without going on and on and on. But Victor is gone, but his work, in particular his books, will always be with us. Thank you. I am most profoundly grateful for the opportunity to say a few words about Professor Viktor Isakov. Back in 2011, when I was working as an Academy Research Fellow at the University of Helsinki, Finland, I became extremely fascinated with a very interesting and deep paper by Professor Viktor Isakov on uniqueness in general in the transmission problem. So this paper it was published in Communications in Mathematical Physics in 2008, and here you can see the first page of this remarkable paper. Following one of the suggestions made by Professor Isakov in his work, I have decided to attempt to extend the analysis to the case of Schrodinger operators in the presence of magnetic field. While working on this project, I have received a lot of invaluable advice and encouragement from Professor Isakov, which has been absolutely crucial for my work. This work would, in fact, never have been completed without Professor Isakov's extremely invaluable help. In May of 2016, I had the great pleasure of meeting and talking to Professor Isakov in the workshop on Dirichlet to Neumann maps, spectral theory, inverse problems, and application, which which uh, held at Oaxaca, Mexico. And here you can see the picture from this workshop. Let me zoom it a little bit. So you can see Viktor Isakov among the participants of this workshop. I remember distinctly the very beautiful talk given by Professor Isakov at this meeting, which was devoted to the problem of increasing stability in inverse problems at high frequency. And luckily, we can still watch the video, rewatch the video of his talk at the BAMF web page. So this is the video of Victor's talk, and let us just watch it for a minute. It's but this one common ground that it is uh, eigenfunctions and but in inverse problems one of crucial issues is stability stability means that how much you it is really incredibly important talk for me and the topic which victor talked it was very influential for my research uh, as recently as March 18 this year, Professor Isakov gave a brilliant talk at our international Zoom Inverse Problem Seminar, which has been, which we have been organizing jointly with Knut Solna during the pandemic time. 
And luckily, we have a video of his talk, which is available on our YouTube channel and in our seminar web page. So the issue is, topic is increasing stability and minimal take and inverse problems. So there are two parts of it. First of all, that one of bigger. So it's extremely beautiful lecture. And it is very sad and indeed shocking to think that this might have been the very last talk that he gave. The work by Professor Isakov had truly a most profound and lasting effect on me. And I am convinced that it will continue to play a fundamental role in the entire inverse problems community, educating and inspiring the new generations of researchers. I would like to express my most heartfelt, sincerest condolences. I am Masahiro Yamamoto from the University of Tokyo. I am so sorry and sad that Victor passed away. I sincerely send my deepest condolence. Especially for Julie, please let me convey my heartiest sympathies. For the first time I met Victor in 1989, more than 30 years ago in California. Since then, I have shared the mathematical life and also as a cultural interest with him. I have attended with him many conferences in Oberbrach, Lago Garda Lake in Lombardia, and Catania in Sicily, and Texas, and Shanghai, etc. And also the general board meetings in London every year. Also, many, many times he visited Japan. This is my great pleasure, many times. And we could enjoy mathematics and talks also on music. He likes especially Russian composer Sergei Rachmaninov. As many know, he played the piano very well and did so, for example, at the music room of Mathematics Institute in Oberbrach. I can have many, many nice memories for spending nice times and beautiful places and also mathematical discussions. Sometimes mathematical discussions were rather hard and serious, of course, needless to say, he is a distinguished expert for inverse problems and made a lot of academic contribution. Victor, I thank you so much for the long-standing friendship, enriching definitely my life. May Victor rest in peace. I am praying for Jury and his family for overcoming this deepest sorrow. Thank you very much. My thoughts are always with you. I'm Jingchen from Fudan University at Shanghai, China. I was deeply saddened when I learned about Victor's passing we lost an esteemed leader in the inverse problem community. I know Professor Isakov's name when I was writing Professor Anger in Linz of Austria as a postdoctor fellow. Professor Anger showed me his joint paper with Victor and told me some story about Victor and his researches. After reading their papers on the uniqueness of an inverse problem for partial differential equations, I finished my first paper on inverse problem. I first met Victor in the international conference in Kyoto University of Japan. After his talk, we shortly discussed some problems. Victor is a genius for inverse problem and he has made several essential contributions on some difficulty in what's problem. He always had some orange idea for the difficulty in what's problem. With Victor, I have discussed some interesting in what's problem, and he can always catch the key points 
and propose the new ideas and the method to solve this problem. Once we organized an international conference in Shanghai to celebrate his 16th birthday, he visited Shanghai several times, and we shared the enjoyable time in our campus. I believe that Victor will be remembered forever by participating in the Inverse Plum community. Thank you for all for coming to celebrate Victor's life and share our grief as his passing. My name is Jianliang Chen. I'm a professor at Michigan State University. I have known Victor's name through his book on inward source problems. From 2005 to 2007, I have spent two years at Wichita State University as an assistant professor. During that time period, I had the fortune to interact with Victor frequently. I have learned a lot from him on, on many research topics. In particular, I have learned from him on inward gravity problems. Along that line, we even written two papers together. Based, based on those works, I have developed a research program on computational gravity problems. Therefore, I appreciate his generosity and his willingness to help others. I'm sure he will be remembered by our research community. I will miss him very much. I'm Mikhail Klebanov. I'm Kalik, inverse Kalik, I would say. And uh, I was a good friend of Viktor Isakov. And even though today is June 1st, 2021, and Viktor died on May 14th, I, uh, I still cannot believe that he died. In my heart, he is alive and he is a young boy. Uh, I knew Viktor for, I don't know, for almost my entire life. When we, I was a student at uh, Novosibirsk State University in Novosibirsk, Russia, uh, his thesis advisor, Professor Alexei Ivanovich Prelepka, was giving us a course in uh, complex analysis. And I remember as Alexei Ivanovich very proudly said, my great graduate student, Viktor Osakov, got a great result. And we, young boys and girls, were very excited by these words. And since then, I took Victor as an exam example of great research. And since then, uh, I, I did, at that time, I didn't know what inverse problems are, frankly. But when I became graduate student of uh, academician Mikhail Lavrentsev, I figured out that uh, it was in 1973, actually. I figured out that Victor was working on English problems and we knew each other in Russia and we uh, still kept our friendship in the uh, United States all working in different universities and uh, not seeing each other and not communicating but we respected each other so much on a very high level. So farewell Victor, you are still alive and young in my heart. My name is Roberto Trigiani and I'm delivering these words also on behalf of my wife, Irena Lasheska. When my wife, Irena Lasheska and I received a mail in mid-May from the former student, PhD student Matthias Heller with the totally unexpected news that Viktor Isakov had passed away two days before, it was truly a painful and uh, earth-shaking shock of disbelief. Our colleague and friend of so many years, with whom we have shared so many memorable moments, 
though it was in common, the common profession that at first brought us together many years ago, we had since shared a deep personal and professional respect combined with a warm sense of friendship. Over the years, we met at MAD conferences in US, but even more frequently abroad, Italy, Poland, sometime with his wife, Julie. And we always found a way to enjoy a dinner together to discuss professional and more broad topics, including, of course, music. We knew who is several years of suffering before 1989 and had tremendous respect for him, for his most courageous stance. Victor was a person of high principle, high moral standards and great humanity, who those standards and those principles enacted in his own personal and professional life. I shall always treasure the two evenings I spent at Julie's and Victor's home in Vichita several years ago when I was invited by him to give a colloquium talk. First, you enter their home, and there you find a grand piano on the left and a grand piano on the right of the entrance. What a remarkable couple. Those evenings were, of course, filled with the piano music and also videos of world-class pianists comparing the very different body styles while playing between, say, Sviatolos, Richter, and Arthur Benedetto Michelangeli. The visit to Vichita was also critically important for me professionally, as it spurred me to move into the area of inverse theory of PDEs, where he was an undisputed world leader. We were frequently exchanging emails regarding professional issues till a few months ago. We shall dearly miss him. We wish to offer to his wife, Julie, our deep condolences in the hope that our genuine appreciation of Victor may soothe the family grief and help preserve his memory. I first met Professor Isaacov uh, shortly after I, I arrived in the United States in 2000. Of course, I knew his influential work in inverse problems. His uh, Springer book on inverse problems for PDEs, then the first edition, was already on my desk. And uh, his uh, uh, beautiful uniqueness proof using singular solutions had already inspired the entire area of sampling methods for solving inverse scattering problems. But uh, meeting Professor Isaacov in person while uh, still being a junior researcher, just to realize that this uh, big name in mathematics is most humbled, soft-spoken, respectful, and a supportive person, uh, gave me a great sense of encouragement and delight. Passing of Professor Isaacov is a huge loss for our community. His uh, legacy as a brilliant mathematician will live forever. Uh, Professor Isaacov will always be remembered as an inspiring teacher, a uh, dear colleague and an exceptional human being. I'm Jenang Wang from Taiwan. I'd like to take this opportunity to pay my respects to Victor. I met Victor in MSI in 2001. At that time, I was a postdoc in MSRI. We both were participants in a program on inverse problems. During that time, I was stuck on a question related to the Kalman estimates, and Victor was an expert on this topic. One day, I visited his office and was kind of nervous that Victor greeted me with enthusiasm. I explained my question to him. It didn't take too long for Victor to come up with a possible solution. I was able to solve the question with Victor's help. We then published our first paper together. Afterwards, we became long-term collaborators. We had worked on several issues on inverse problems especially on the increasing stability phenomena, for which Victor was truly a pioneer, a trailblazer. I feel so lucky to be able to work with Victor for almost 20 years. I also consider working with Victor a privilege. He was a great mentor 
and was always willing to share his ideas with others. Victor, your profound contribution to the development of inverse problems will be always remembered. Rest in peace. How do you encapsulate a life as significant <clears throat> as Victor's? In a few short words, a paltry few paragraphs. First and foremost, as you have just heard, he was a man of brilliant intellect, and the beautiful mind that was Victor's mastered and made advancements in the most fundamental discipline mankind has to explain existence itself, mathematics. He was truly a giant in his field, and many of you are here today because you were first exposed to that brilliance. But that was only one facet of a wonderful life lived with determination, passion, kindness, and love. And these qualities are what drew you today to honor him. What I must tell you about today in a little time that I have is Victor the man, his spirit, his soul. Victor was a gentleman and a gentle man, and he never let the brilliance of his mind deter him from living a life filled with the things that we all hold dear, family, friends, and a joie de vivre for living that only a lucky few attain. In my mind, I think of him spending Sunday afternoons with Walter Mays playing duets, with Julie safely ensconced away from the house, the two men talking about music and composers to their heart's content. I think of him growing peonies in his garden simply because they were Julie's favorite, all the while cursing in Russian when he pricked himself on the rose bushes. And as for getting pricked, I think of his eight-foot-tall Sirius cactus, sometimes in the hallway, sometimes outside. The challenge was how to get the night-blooming monstrosity from the hallway staircase to the outdoors, a process involving towels on both the cactus and himself for the sake of self-preservation. But those who knew him knew he was not a man not deterred by the challenge of a few pricks. His very name was a metaphor for overcoming the challenges of a post-Stalin Siberia to make his way to Wichita State in 1988. As you have already heard from him, from his colleagues, while a student at Novosibirsk State University, he started to work in a new and challenging area of applied mathematics, inverse problems in partial differential equations. After graduation, he was appointed as a researcher in what is now the Sobolev Institute of Mathematics of the Siberian branch of the Academy of Sciences. He was also an associate professor at the same time at Novosibirsk State University. His research was very successful. While there, he solved two significant mathematical problems, published 24 papers, and in 1981 submitted his second doctoral thesis on inverse problems of potential theory to the Moscow State University. In 1982, however, he felt a growing dissatisfaction with the Soviet system and applied for an immigration visa from the USSR. As a result, he was fired from all of his positions and had to wait through five years of unemployment before the exit visa was finally granted. In 1987, he left for the USA, staying for two months as a visiting professor at the University of Florence. After appointments as visiting researcher at the Courant Institute of NYU, Cornell University, and University of Minnesota, in 1988, he was appointed a professor at Wichita State University. Victor was a man of many passions, and here at Wichita State, he was able to pursue those passions. 
His professional passion was, of course, mathematics, and he continued his groundbreaking work, becoming one of the leading authorities in the world in inverse problems. That work led to the Kansas Board of Regents conferring the title of Distinguished Professor upon him in 2006. His ascetic passion was for music, particularly piano, which he played at an exceptionally high level. He loved the music of Mozart, Haydn, Liszt, Rachmaninoff, Scriabin, and especially Schubert. And that love of music extended to listening to it, becoming a true audiophile and collecting hundreds of recordings of great artists interpreting great works. Leonid Shukayev, who you will hear himself, an internationally distinguished cellist, and Victor's co-conspirator in the collecting and telling of Russian stories, especially Russian jokes tells the story of meeting Victor at a reception during his interview to join the faculty at Wichita State. Victor took him aside and in all seriousness asked him, of all the great pianists, which in your opinion is the greatest? Leonov pondered, then said he thought Sviatoslav Richter was in his opinion the best. Victor smiled broadly and said, yes, I agree. Leonid got the distinct impression he had just passed the test, and in Victor's opinion, was now sanctioned to be a colleague at WSU. He also went on to become one of Victor's closest friends here. Victor's personal passion was his wife of 22 years, Julie Bees. Julie. He pursued her in typical Victor fashion. Having arrived at Wichita State in the fall of 88, he thought he would stay only a few years before moving on. He was looking for a place where he could not only work at a high professional level, but also enjoy music, its concerts and recitals, on an equal plane. Early on, he went to a recital in this very hall, which confirmed for him the high level of artistry he was to enjoy here. The young female professor playing the piano totally enraptured him, and he was hooked. Returning with increasing frequency, he proactively sought out any and all recitals she was involved with, eventually summing enough courage to present her with flowers and finally taking the plunge to ask her out. To his surprise, she accepted. However, on their inaugural date, in the spirit of full transparency, she informed him, I'm married. While she was separated and in the process of divorcing her husband, she was still technically married. That's okay, Victor countered. So am I. Marital entanglements resolved. They became one of Wichita State's power couples, both internationally known in their respective fields. Not that the courtship was without its challenges. Early on, in their first social occasion outside the concert hall, Victor invited Julie to a celebration party at his house to mark the purchase of his new Steinway B piano. At the party, they sat down together to play four hands. While a truly excellent player, Victor evidently had trouble counting rests, at least on this particular occasion. Victor, Julie declared, you're a mathematician. You should be able to count to four. This was a dubious beginning to what became a beloved ritual. The two of them sitting side by side, making beautiful music together. Another of their beloved side by side rituals was cooking together. That too had its roots in the courtship 
in their courtship, and that too had a somewhat dubious beginning. Victor's first endeavor to share his country's culinary culture with her fell flat, very flat. He fixed her a meal of all traditional Russian dishes, only to have her turn up her nose at it. How could he know that cod liver would not go over as a delicacy? He soon, however, found her gastronomic groove, and she won him over, he won her over with plav, a Magno, Magnolian, Mongolian dish of lamb and rice cooked in a traditional manner in a special pot with juniper berries, currants, and other spices topped with an entire bulb of garlic. Together, they hosted many evenings for friends, family, and Wichita and WSU colleagues. As happy as they were doing things as a couple, they were both independent people and enjoyed interests on their own. They both loved to travel and both did so, many times together, but also many times separately when on professional endeavors. Victor would take photos and he was an excellent photographer. Somehow, while still in Siberia, he managed to acquire a Leica camera not a piece of equipment easily attained at that time in the Soviet Union. He carried it with him on many of his travels, creating a library of thousands of amazing photos and images with it. He loved history and was a student of the human condition, not just Russian history, but French, German, as well as historical figures such as Genghis Khan. He collected owls, figurines, drawings, photos, etc. He saw them as his spiritual soulmate, both known for their intelligence, both with so much more to them than the cliché of wisdom. And he loved cars, especially Volvos, several of which he purchased and enjoyed as much for their safety features as anything. This proved to be prophetic one night while running an errand, an encounter with a semi that turned out to not be a near miss, left Victor intact, but the car totaled. Calling Julie to come pick him up, he said in his dry, sardonic way, Volvo is no more. And now, Victor is no more. Much of what he did, much of what he accomplished, will live on forever in the hundreds of papers, journals, and books that comprised his significant contribution to mathematics, to the world. But that is what he did, not who he was. Julie has received messages of condolence from every part of the globe, professional colleagues expressing their great sorrow at his passing. To a person, what they highlight is not his great intellectual accomplishments, but his humanity. Words such as kind, humble, gracious, thoughtful, polite, and benevolent abound in their memories of him. A great light has gone out, and it is a great light because the shimmer of his intellectual accomplishments was magnified by his character. That will be Victor's true and perpetual legacy, his humanity. Farewell, my dear friend. You are missed already.
You will not see the sun rise in the east or watch the moon travel in the night sky. The wind will not kiss your face. The grass will not caress your feet. Today, beloved, you are going home. May the ancestors come to meet you. May your journey be joyous. Thank you. 
We thank you for sharing these memories of Victor with us and hope that they have been an inspiration to you. On behalf of the mathematicians and Julie, we thank you. And we ask that you might come to the reception to commune even further. Thank you.